Welcome to the NNP Symposium. Um, thank you for joining us and watching the recording. Uh, we had a few technical difficulties during this original presentation, so we are re-recording the beginning few slides. Um, you'll notice that after those, David's face will appear on the video um, and everything will be as it was originally. Um, we just had to fill in the gap a little bit. Uh, so thank you everyone for bearing with us and especially to David for being willing to redo this beginning portion. Um, and without further ado, I will shut up and let David take it away, telling us about Whitman's blue coin folders as collectibles. All right, thank you, Liana. Um, this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I can't remember a time in my life when uh, Whitman blue folders and other Whitman coin products have not been a part of it. Um, at some point during my adulthood, I became a collector of these things and I've since written a series of books on coin boards uh, and folders and albums of various publishers. Uh, the most recent one I did came out in 2020, and that was on Whitman's coin folders and albums, having done their coin boards, uh, the predecessors in another book. And so we're going to talk about the virtues of collecting these old blue coin folders. I think everybody knows what we're talking about here. And uh, let me jump into the first slide here. Uh, we have here photographic proof that I have been a coin collector for longer than I care to remember. Uh, I started about the age of seven or so when my older brother, who had collected coins, oh, maybe for a summer or two, uh, lost interest and gave me his partial set of Lincoln cents to work on. And I took to it immediately and never looked back. And we have a nice little souvenir from this occasion. Um, actually, this is this is. Uh, this photo you're seeing is taken a couple of years later. Uh, once I got started on my brother's penny collection, uh, I soon found that uh, I wasn't making much progress at all. It was already, even by 1965, hard to find the mint mark since before 1940. So I was kind of hitting a wall there. Well, our next door neighbor uh, named Bob, he was a collector of various things, coins included. And so to my delight, one evening he came over and uh, helped work on my coin collection. First, to give you some idea of how he managed to acquire so many pennies that he could spare them, uh, he was an officer in the San Francisco Harbor Patrol, and one of his job responsibilities was emptying the parking meters along the San Francisco waterfront. So as you can imagine, he had access to a tremendous number and variety of coins. Um, you see on the table there, he's got a nice little wooden box, which knowing Bob, he probably made that himself. He had all sorts of handy work uh, tools and whatever. But uh, I remember that he had tubes filled with shield nickels, Liberty nickels, Indian cents, even had three cent pieces, which people had mistakenly or intentionally tried to pass as dimes in the parking meters. So when he come over, it came over a couple years after I got started collecting, uh, he sat down at the table and behind that uh, little forest of tubes you're looking at is my Whitman folder for Lincoln cents 1909 to 40. And he proceeded to fill all of the openings that I hadn't been able to complete with the exception of the four keys. I think you can guess which ones. Uh, he did not have duplicates of those, but I was just in heaven. Do you imagine after two years of being stalled, I was very excited to now have a nearly complete set of coins. And it just so happens that my brother, the one who had given me the penny set, uh, had received a camera for his birthday just a few days earlier. And so he uh, eagerly took a snapshot of this which is very unusual because it's the only record I have of having collected coins as a child and were not his for his enthusiasm with the camera, uh, probably this moment wouldn't have been recorded. And so that's my dad standing behind me, Bob seated at the table and his daughter Robin uh, with him. Uh, she was about a year ahead of me in school. And as much as I'd like to say that that uh, Whitman folder over on the right hand side was mine, well, it is now, but it's not the original one. Uh, some years ago, the folder was traded for a bookshelf album, the kind with the slides. So the old folder went bye-bye, but this is the very same type and it's the same vintage and even the same edition. And that blue book you see, the 1964 edition was my one and only coin book at that time. And whatever information or misinformation I managed to acquire, I had to run it through that book. And I've just created this little scene here. This actually appears in my Whitman coin folder and album book, kind of to set the mood right at the beginning in the intro. And it does uh, seem very reminiscent of that time. All of the folders are period to the mid 60s. 
uh, even the little plastic magnifiers from a Whitman coin collecting kit of that period as well. So with that nice little atmosphere and background, let's plunge right ahead here. Uh, well, another thing that I encountered as a child is that coin collecting was extremely prominent at that time. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of coin collectors these days, but you wouldn't know it by going into most stores. In those days, almost every retail establishment had some sort of coin uh, selection or coin folder selection. Even things as odd as gas stations and newsstands would be selling coin folders. Well, what we see here is the grander scheme of things. On the left is a coin shop in Portland in the early 1960s that had the entire Whitman line. Uh, it would be some while before I encountered an actual coin shop. I didn't even know of these things in, when I was seven years old or nine years old when that picture was taken. And on the right is a Whitman staged photo for one of its catalogs. This is the 1965 edition where it's showing that it's uh, retailers how that they can display Whitman coin products. But the the issue here that I want to emphasize so much is that coin collecting was everywhere in the 60s. It was in popular TV shows. It formed the theme of many sitcoms. Uh, it was in the media everywhere you went and every sort of retail establishment, even toy stores, I remember, used to have coin and stamp collecting supplies. And these days, you don't even really see toy, toy stores anymore in this age of uh, Amazon and eBay and whatever. But it was very much a presence in those days. and. Uh, it was almost impossible not to become a coin collector, even if you did it just briefly as my brother did. I, on the other hand, of course, just really took to it immediately and never let go. Uh, aiding one's collecting, particularly for beginners, Whitman used to put out coin collecting hobby kits. Uh, and on the left here, we see the very first one from 1962. Uh, this came out just a few weeks before the Christmas Hanukkah holiday season and it was a tremendous seller. It was an instant hit. Uh, the very next year, Whitman put out one for Canadian coins using all of the same uh, materials, but with different graphics. Uh, the US coin hobby kit is scarce. Uh, I see one maybe every two to three years on eBay. The Canadian version is extremely scarce. Uh, I have only seen one in all my years of collecting, and that is the one that's in my hobby and is pictured in my book. Uh, perhaps there may be greater availability in Canada, but uh, certainly online, I have not seen another example. And on the right, we see something that came out a few years after that. This is the budget-minded coin collecting kit. Uh, this was from 1966, and these retailed at just $1. You see there's that little plastic magnifier again. You have folders for Lincoln Cents and Jefferson Nichols, and the first edition of Ken Brissett's book, Let's Collect Coins. It, I suppose it was probably written for this coin kit, uh, but then it's proceeded to go on through many editions over the years. And this kit here is a little more common. These you see come up on eBay about once a year or so, usually kind of beat up, but uh, the example illustrated is from my collection and it's probably the cleanest one I've seen. Now to aid collectors in those days, uh, Whitman used to put out a checklist. Uh, this was something that dealers could give to their customers for free if you went into a coin shop or even a hobby shop would always have these. And uh, Whitman deliberately left the uh, blank space down at the front of the cover uh, near the bottom and it offered dealers the option of having it custom printed for their own business or uh, as most dealers chose they would have just have that blank and then the dealer would stamp his own name and address on there. So it reminded collectors who were using this where it where they could get the additional supplies. And also if uh, you were showing your collection to somebody else, it would give them some idea to go. Uh, these are very collectible, these checklists. I have many editions going back all the way to the first one in 1942. This one uh, you can date by the list of titles that were available. Uh, the most recently added folders that I see on that list in the far right were the Liberty Seated Half Dollar folders. Those were added to the line in 1956. And the next edition was for peace dollars in 1957, which I do not see that one. So I think we can pretty much date this to 1956 or seven. Uh, just a little bit of fun trivia that you can actually collect these almost in annual editions if you really wanna take it that far. Now, a little bit of history. Uh, a lot of people know that the first Whitman blue folders came out in 1940. 
although Whitman was not the company that invented this product, despite much of their marketing in later years that claimed they did. Uh, actually, it was Daniel Stamp Company, uh, still known today as Dansko, that came out with the first coin folder in 1939. A year later, Joseph Oberweis, who had been producing the big 11 by 14 coin boards, as had Whitman, came out with his folder. And then a few months later, right at the end of 1940, debuted Whitman's familiar blue folder, and it's been with us ever since. Uh, Whitman took their time to develop the product and get it perfected. What we're looking at here is the actual prototype for the very first Whitman folder. And one thing you'll notice is that the title is quite elaborate. And, and by the way, this is all hand painted directly onto the paper. Uh, this is an artist's mock-up. And one of the things they were trying to establish is what sort of border device to use. You see at the left is the horizontal, or excuse me, the vertical line, and then two diagonal lines. These are intended to simulate or suggest a book that's bound in half leather, would have that sort of pattern of leather over the boards. And on the right, we see a pattern that was rejected, this endless vine of leaves. And on the left, we see the one that was actually used, a little a series of a double helix with a broad stripe in, in three different places. And that's what the one that they decided on, which is in this case was actually the back cover of the folder. But then this was just a mock-up. Uh, this item is unique so far as I know. Uh, I acquired it from a former Whitman employee some years ago. And needless to say, it is the premier piece in my collection. I'm pretty sure it's irreplaceable. Inside this folder, you could see again, the art department at Whitman was doodling. Uh, in place of the text that would appear there later, they just made a few scribbles to demonstrate what they had in mind. And then there are two versions of what would become the end flap, that piece of paper that's taped to the end of the folder and folds up inside the, with the rest of the boards. Uh, a, it says very faintly in pencil there, is the list, meaning the list of available titles. Uh, this actually ended up being on the outside of the end flap, the piece you see when you first open the folder. And then B, where it says information, that text describing the coin series ended up on the inside of the uh, end flap. So you have to open it all the way to see that. This is the first production version. This is what resulted from all the experiments. You see uh, how they went with the border with the double helix and the broad stripes. Uh, this is a first edition folder from 1940. And the way we know that is because it has an entirely different type of paper than what was used later on. You see the cover there is very, very deeply grained. Uh, it has a very leather-like texture to it. A uh, fellow collector calls this lizard skin. I sometimes call it alligator skin, but you get the idea. It does not look like the current generation of Whitman folders. And in fact, these were only made in 1940 and 41 which defines the first edition. Very, very rare for almost all titles, although Lincoln Sense naturally is going to be one of the ones you do see uh, maybe once or twice a year. But uh, these are actually quite rare. There were only 22 titles in the original edition of 1940-41, and I'm still missing just one. I have, no long, I have not yet found the folder first edition for silver three cent pieces, which as you can imagine was not a big seller and it was only in production for two years. It's a rare item that may not even have survived. Uh, another distinctive feature of these early folders is that the black backing paper is this deep texture from the cover, but it's also a jet black color. And that was used only in 1940 to about 42. It transitioned into the second edition, but we know it's the first edition here because of the graining visible within the openings. Um, another feature that's interesting to note on this, all Whitman folders made since 1949 for the Lincoln Sense series have six rows of openings. This early one has seven. And the reason they stopped that in 1949 is customers were complaining that the folders got bent. The openings were too close together. And so they rearranged them to make them six rows instead of seven. And the final thing we're showing there is the end flap. We're talking about the information. Obviously, it's a half cent folder. It's not the one from the other two images there. But I thought the half cent folder was particularly interesting because it comes with a list of varieties 
uh, for that coin series, popular red book type varieties. Although there was no red book when this came out, there wasn't even a blue book yet. And another thing before we move on, uh, I want you to note the very early Whitman folders up until about the early part of 1944 uh, are usually spotted by the fact that they list both the headquarters in Racine, Wisconsin, and also the satellite plant in Poughkeepsie, New York. As it is, Whitman's product was so successful and grew so quickly that by the end of the 1940s, they had about three or four satellite plants, uh, most of which were right in Racine. Uh, and so by that time, they had, had no reason to continue listing Poughkeepsie. There was nothing novel about it. So that was dropped early in 1944. Now we move ahead to the second edition. And just so you don't panic, I'm not going to go through all eight editions. We're not, we're not going to be here for three hours. But I wanted to point out, first of all, notice the difference in the paper. I'll go back just briefly so you can see the difference. Alligator skin, finely grained. And this is the texture for Whitman folders, probably for the next 40 to 50 years, uh, although now they have a little more of a slick surface to them. Uh, notice too that this folder is a commemorative issue. Uh, the head of the coin department marketing and product development was the familiar R.S. Yeoman, as his pen name is. He was actually Richard S. Yeo, and they took R.S. Yeoman as a pen name. And that's how most people in the hobby know him, unless you actually knew the man. Uh, but he developed uh, an interest in the hobby because he felt that that was part of promoting and marketing. You needed to know what your customers wanted. And so he was not a numismatist to begin with, but he became one. And here we have proof of it in this little commemorative uh, folder from the Racine Numismatic Society's 1942 banquet. Uh, you see there in the lower right, the gore of the V on the right-hand side, it lists the officers and who is the president of the Racine Numismatic Society, none other than R.S. Yeoman, again, using his pen name. Uh, this is a very, very rare item because as you can imagine, it was only distributed to the people at the banquet in 1942. So I know of one other of these, but uh, they are not common and they do not turn up on eBay. Each one of these that I found is something that was brought to me because people know I collect these things. Another one was done in 1943. Uh, I won't show that because it's not quite as graphically pleasing. Uh, for those of you who don't know your history or are not old enough to remember, V stood for victory because this was during World War II and particularly early in World War II. This was April of 1942. The United States was losing almost every battle, and it really looked grim for the first half of that year. So the V for victory symbol was used uh, extensively, as it was in Britain at that time. Another rare product from the second edition period, which, by the way, runs from 1942 all the way up into early 1953. Uh, there are three divisions, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3 but I won't attempt to explain them. The differences are too subtle. And if you're really getting into this, you can uh, find it in my book. It explains it more thoroughly. Uh, this is a really rare item. And first thing you notice about this Whitman folder is number one, it has slightly different border treatment. It doesn't have the double helix on the left. Two, it's much taller than a Whitman folder. It's the normal width, but you can see the proportions are different. And this was a product that sold for $1 as opposed to 25 cents for all of the other Whitman folders. This was a complete United States typeset folder, uh, excluding only the gold issues. And it literally had everything from half cents through silver dollars, including the coins that were all but unobtainable. Uh, small, small eagle, half dollar, small eagle quarter, very rare coins. Uh, it was a very attractive and deluxe presentation. You can see that it comes with a little paper pocket on one of the pages there that holds the little booklet. You see there's the booklet superimposed and also shown tucked into its pocket. Uh, this was written by Yeoman with assistance from a couple of people who uh, were credited in the Blue Book. And this actually grew out of Whitman's Blue Book, which debuted in 1942. They felt they had enough material to make this little handbook of type coins. This product was not successful. Very few of them sold. They're very seldom seen today. And when they are seen, they're almost always in just terrible condition. 
Um, I don't know why they got so beat up, but they did. So this is far and away the finest known to me and probably two or three grades better than any of the duplicates I've had a chance to sell over the years. Uh, because the product wasn't successful five years later, they split it into two type coin folders, volumes one and volume two for half cents through quarters and half dollars through dollars. I think that was prompted by the addition of the Roosevelt dime and Franklin half dollar. This original folder left no room to put in additional openings, so they realized they'd have to redo it. And uh, that was actually a neat item too, because it was sold in a box set. It had a, a sole under box with the two folders and the type coin book, which was now enlarged to the size of the coin folder and covered in blue. And that second edition of the type coin booklet uh, is fairly common. You can find it from time to time. You don't often see the complete box set with the two folders and the handbook intact. This is another extraordinarily rare item from the uh, early years of Whitman. It's actually from 1954. And as you might guess from the poor quality of the image here, I do not actually own this item. This is an image I found online and I've never actually seen this in person, never heard of anybody who has one. Uh, this was commissioned by the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company of Fort Wayne, Indiana in 1954 uh, as a promotional item. Uh, I don't know exactly how they marketed this because none of the literature has survived or I've not seen it, but we know that it was made by Whitman because it says in very tiny print down at the bottom of the end flap, it says Whitman Publishing Company, Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, an interesting item in that it does not have any mint marks for the Lincoln Cent series. Instead, on the end flap, it says three separate collections and users are instructed to get three of these folders one for each of the three mints. Uh, it's a very odd way of presenting it and it's unique to this uh, custom produced item. Anyway, this is certainly something to look, be on the lookout for. And uh, if you do find one, I hope you find two because I still need one and I would love to have the opportunity to buy this. Another rare item from uh, Whitman's earlier years, although we're now into this 1960s, um, there was a very clever fellow named Joseph Siegel who in 1964 founded General Numismatics Corporation, which quickly became much better known under its coining division name, the Franklin Mint. I think pretty much everybody has heard of that in context with either coins and metals or their later marketing more often of collectibles in the non-numismatic area. Take a little drink of water, bear with me. Um, when Silver dollars started to disappear from casinos in the summer of 1964. The casino owners panicked and their first impression was to file off the dates from the coins. Uh, I've never actually seen one of those, but I've seen old pictures from the period where somebody had filed the date off the silver dollar in the uh, mistaken notion that people were hoarding them before their collector value. The fact of the matter is everybody took home the silver dollars they won in, in the Nevada casinos because they were already worth more than $1 just for their silver value. So that attempt to keep them in circulation failed. And the casinos had to commission nickel gaming tokens. They were made of nickel or nickel alloy. And the company that produced these in 1965 was General Numismatics Corporation, or as we know it more familiarly, Franklin Mint. And one of the things that Siegel did because he was a very very much in tune with the numismatic marketplace, he ordered from Whitman this custom folder so that people could actually collect the gaming tokens. Uh, I don't know that it was very successful because the folder by itself is quite rare and I've never seen one with the uh, $1 tokens in it. So I don't think this was terribly successful. Siegel did better when he contracted a year or two later with Dansko to produce actual slide type albums for the later 1966 and 67 uh, issues of casino tokens. So those of you who collect casino tokens, that's kind of what kick-started the hobby was this folder and uh, the efforts of Siegel to promote them as numismatics. Again, a very rare item. Um, I think I've seen just two or three of them in 10 years. So something to be on the lookout for. We have something quite a bit later. This is actually uh, 
is from Whitman's ninth edition, which is 1978 to somewhere in the late 90s. Whitman's history in that period is a little bit spotty. But basically, uh, this goes beyond the time frame of my book, which ends with the eighth edition in 1978. But it is these are cool items from my collection that you should be on the lookout for. This is Whitman's standard 20th century type coin folder. Uh, by this time in the 1990s, the graphics had changed. The Whitman folders no longer look like the ones that are in my book. Uh, but it is, in all respects, conventional Whitman folders. They've simply been overprinted for the Central States Numismatic Society conventions. The first one in 1990 was overprinted in gold. And then five years later, when Whitman was entering a period of somewhat distress, the, the company actually shut down its Racine operation shortly after this. So they did something similar. They are a little bit simpler. They produced an overprint in the basic silver color. You can almost ignore it there. It's so hard to see on that second example. But uh, these items are not super rare. Uh, again, they were distributed primarily to the people who attended the central states banquets in those years. And uh, I've seen probably three or four of the one on the left is a little more common. The one on the right, because both the hobby was in the doldrums and Whitman was uh, not as prolific in the 1990s, uh, and we got into the mid to late 90s. The one on the right is somewhat scarcer, and that's something uh, that I have not seen a second example of. Though I imagine there are plenty of people still in the hobby who went to these conventions and probably have this sitting in a closet somewhere, not realizing there's, there's anything collectible about it. But it's a nice little item that you can pick up if you're really careful and watch the uh, eBay and a few other venues. Another commemorative that's very collectible, this one fairly common, uh, this marks the 50th anniversary of Whitman's coin folder in 1990. And these were distributed very, very widely all through the year, primarily at that year's a and convention in Seattle. And you can get some sense of the size of this from the fact that those, are, those openings are holding Lincoln cents, or were intended to hold Lincoln cents. So you can see this thing's a little baby folder it's about the quarter, the quarter the size of an actual Whitman folder. And uh, there's a photo there of the cover that also shows the spine text on there. And these, were, or these are fairly common. I, I see these on eBay maybe three or four times a year. So there's no reason not to pick up one of these. And they don't bring a lot of money because the, despite my, uh, my, my promotions and publicizing of Whitman folders as collectibles, it hasn't really taken off yet, except for the first edition folders, which are already bringing very high prices. So this is something you pick off for very cheaply, probably $10 or less on eBay. It's a neat little item. And I snagged about four or five of them from Whitman at the convention. You can see I got a little greedy there, but I couldn't help myself. I've never seen any of these with the coins in place. So I don't think that uh, Whitman did that. Uh, maybe it did so for its employees or some key people or whatever, but the ones given out at the convention did not have any coins. In contrast, six years later, they did put out another little mini folder again, which in some in instances came with the coins in place. Uh, this is just such one. Uh, I picked up two of these at the convention in 96, which I think was Denver. Uh, that silver dime, the 1946 dime, was bright and looking brand new when I got it. So you can see uh, coin folders are not the best thing for preserving coin surface, but uh, this was a commemorative that was put out to mark not the coin folders anniversary, but the 50th anniversary of Yeoman's Red Book. And one of the interesting features of this is that the proportions are different from the earlier mini folder because the proportions had to match that of the book. Although it's a miniature, as you can see by its size relative to the dime, the length and width of this are proportional to the red book itself. Whereas on the earlier one, you can see that the proportions of the cover match those of a blue Whitman folder. So different purpose, slightly similar concept. This one here is uh, somewhat scarcer, I would say, than the 1990. I'm not sure if they just didn't print as many or what was going on there. But again, 1996, when this came out, was the year that Whitman shut down its uh, Racine operation. It was sold. It had actually had been sold several times during the 70s, 80s, 90s. And it kind of hit a, a funky period there in the late 90s. So I don't think they distributed too many of these. 
uh, the vast majority that were put out did not have the coins. So it's a rare item with or without the dimes. Going back another 30 years or so, we're back in the 60s again. Favorite time of mine back when I discovered coin collecting. This is a neat little item that is not really a coin folder in the sense that you're supposed to fill it with coins. Uh, a lot of times you'll see these on eBay, people will be selling them as US type coin holders. Well, they were not. And the reason we know that is number one, the title, it clearly says coin size testing chart. And also that uh, beneath each opening is a catalog number referring to the specific size of the coin holder that you were ordering. Uh, Whitman did and still does, I believe, put out these clear plastic styrene holders snap together holders in a nice two by two square format. But one of the problems that dealers were finding is when people were buying these plastic holders, they didn't always know which one to get. Now, Whitman put out this in 1963, this little booklet here to show you uh, which one to order for each size of United States and Canadian coins. However, one of the things that dealers reported back to Whitman is that People wanted these holders for foreign coins as well that did not come in the same sizes as US and Canadian. So um, that's when they came out with this coin size testing chart. You could literally put the coin you were buying in this, in this chart, in this little holder and see which catalog number beneath the opening was the closest match for size. And then you knew which size of plastic holder to buy. This, uh, this is actually the same width as a full-size Whitman folder, but it's exactly half the height. So if you stack these one atop the other, it'll be this very same height and width as a normal Whitman folder. As the world market continued to grow during the 60s and Whitman got requests for different size plastic holders, they added to that line, making another couple dozen sizes, and they reissued this coin size testing chart in the full format folder. So the full size of a Whitman folder. That one is seen a little more often. It has a lot more openings, a lot more catalog numbers. And uh, you do see that one a little more familiarly. Uh, this half size one is quite scarce. And one of the real prizes in my collection is a factory wrapped paper bundle of all of these, uh, a dozen of these coin size testing charts still in the original factory wrap which in the early days Whitman used uh, like butcher paper that was printed with their own graphics and text. Uh, when they get into the 1980s and later, uh, folders come shrink wrapped as do most products these days, but the early ones are paper wrapped. And you'll see some examples of that a little later on. A Couple other interesting items you don't see very often. Uh, the first one on the left is a Whitman folder for Canadian five cent pieces. 1961 to date. Uh, you notice, however, that the cover doesn't seem to match the Whitman product. Well, as we got into the 1980s and 90s, uh, Whitman cut back its coin folder production to just the most popular titles, the ones that they knew dealers would order all of the time. So essentially, it was trimmed back all the way to just 20th century United States coins. But there were still dealers who wanted folders for the Canadian titles, and perhaps the most prominent of these was Verge Marshall III, known as the Penny Merchant. He had a business, a tremendous mail order business based out of Nebraska. And he had a huge market for Canadian cents and nickels, or five cent pieces as they're correctly called. We call them nickels here in America. And since Whitman was not inclined to produce folders strictly for the general market uh, of the usual style, it took this custom order from Marshall and these were put out under the star brand name. And it, it took me a little while to figure out how he came up with the star brand name. And then suddenly it dawned on me, how could I have missed it? His name is Marshall and a Marshall wears a star. So that's what he chose for this. And up until about 15 or 20 years ago, these were quite common. You could even buy original uh, shrink wrap bundles of these. By now they were in plastic rather than paper. And just in the last few years, I've noticed you don't see them anymore. They, they've been fully distributed. There's no hoards. So uh, it's something to look out for. They come for Canadian small cents. There are one for that. And then there's also two for five cents. And then on the right is an ordinary Whitman folder, seemingly. However, what's interesting about it is the logo, that Globe logo. 
uh, with Whitman not printed, but rather shown in silhouette, the blue paper against the silver uh, oval. This was used only for the seventh edition, which was printed only in 1967. And these are generally fairly scarce. Uh, you see the, the little detail below that shows the Whitman logo that they eventually settled on for the eighth edition, which had a very long run from 1968 to 78. Those are common as all get up. But the seventh edition with the large uh, silhouette logo, logo, those are quite rare for most titles. Uh, this half dollar for Canadian folder being one of the rare ones. Uh, the only ones you see with that logo commonly are the three Washington quarters, Roosevelt dimes, Lincoln cents, and uh, Roosevelt and Mercury dimes. Uh, all other titles for that are quite rare, and there are only a few titles printed with this because they were in production for less than a year. So that's something to look for if you want to find some scarce item that nobody else knows about and you can buy for a dollar or two. Here we get into a really interesting area of Whitman collectibles. Uh, the fellow up on the right there with Dick Yeoman, he's Yeoman's on the left, on the right, that's Don Hirshhorn, and he was Whitman's biggest jobber, a jobber being a wholesale mass distributor of Whitman products. He was so big that he had locations all over the United States and even overseas, and he's the one who actually supplied the individual coin stores. Whitman didn't sell those directly, they went through their jobbers, and Don Hirshhorn was the most successful and most prominent of those. He had such a good market in the United Kingdom and Ireland that he actually had Whitman produce a line of folders for Irish coins. And these were never marketed in the United States, they're never seen in the United States, and they're even rare in Britain and Ireland. Uh, these were produced only in 1968 and seven, 1968 to 70. Um, the ones with the green covers for Ireland were produced only in a single printing in 1970. There are eight titles of Irish folders. Uh, they're all very, very rare. Uh, I would buy this in any condition I find it in because they just don't see them. Uh, and like I say, they're even scarce in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Uh, they did not sell well, so there was never a second printing. And um, this is something you just don't see very often. It's, it's strange to see a, a Woodman folder with a green cover, although in later years, they got a little more liberal with the colors. But this is a rarity to find. These eight Irish folders are very tough. Inside the Irish folders, you see the usual sort of text about the coin series. Uh, notice that the publishing information is not Racine, Wisconsin. And in the very lower right of the uh, first, end flap, first side of the end flap on the left there, you see it, it says made in GB, Great Britain. So these were not printed in, in Wisconsin. The other side has a list of the available titles all of the British titles that Hirshhorn produced, uh, most of which were unique to Hirshhorn. Whitman produced folders for, hat, for farthings through shillings, I believe, but nothing larger. Hirshhorn ordered folders for uh, florins, half crowns, uh, unprinted folders for, uh, for custom collections, all different things. And those are all in the 8,000 series. Those are the unique Hirshhorn printings, but they have the blue covers familiar to uh, most Americans. Uh, you see below that listed the eight Irish titles, and then you get into something really interesting. There are five titles for the Channel Islands of Jersey and Guernsey. Now, the truth of the matter is these were never printed, but they were proposed, and they were given catalog numbers by Hirshhorn. Uh, the Irish folders were such a flop that the Jersey and Guernsey folders were never printed. And I'm, I'm quite certain of that, even though no documentation exists of that, because if there was even one out there, I would have seen it or heard of it by now. Another collectible that goes with the uh, Whitman folders is printing plates. You can see that this is the design of a Whitman folder, a mirror image, because this is these are the plates that actually printed them. And the uh, I have three of these in my collection. They've all come from different sources. It turns out I eventually figured out where they were coming from. In the 1980s, when uh, the publishing or printing technology had changed and they no longer used these uh, metal plates anymore, uh, Yeoman got the idea of putting them out as souvenirs to their biggest jobbers, their main wholesale buyers. And he had produced a cover letter with that and signed a little note to each of the dealers. And each of these major dealers got one of these printing plates. 
and they very, very seldom come on the market today. Uh, as I said, all three of the ones I have have come from different sources. Uh, the interesting thing about these two folders, these are from Whitman's sixth edition, which carries the Eagle logo with the Whitman logo, with the Whitman escutcheon across the Eagle's breast. These were prepared for sixth edition folders, but they were never actually printed with these titles. So these plates were never used. You'll never find these titles with the Eagle logo on them. However, I do have one that was actually used. This is an eighth edition printing plate for the very familiar Jefferson Nickel folder. That's one of the titles that's in print perennially. So every edition has it. And that's why uh, you actually have an example of the folder printed from this plate. A uh, little interesting bit of trivia, this plate was originally produced for the fourth edition, which was the first to have an illustrated cover, but it had no logo on the cover. That logo you see has been added for the eighth edition, and you can see the discoloration around there where it was actually uh, welded or brazed onto an existing plate. No hobbies complete in numismatics unless you collect errors, and here are some error folders. Most of these errors are pretty obvious what happened. They were simply out of register. And uh, these turn up occasionally. Uh, usually when dealers got these things, they threw them out or they returned them to Whitman for a refund. So they're not that common. Uh, certainly very few people who got these folders wanted to use them. Um, less obvious to what happened are the ones at the bottom row there. Uh, the first is an early folder for Lincoln Sense. You can tell that because it has seven rows instead of six rows. And what looks like the first page or the first panel of the folder is actually the third panel printed upside down, or let's say mounted upside down. They were printed and then mounted to the covers. And we know this is a very early one also because the dates and minages end with 1941. So it was almost certainly printed in 1942. Well, that was an assembly error rather than a printing error. And then another assembly error is what appears to be a mercury dime folder until you open it up and it's actually all of the contents are for buffalo nickels. Uh, this sort of thing did occur and very few of these survived because most were returned or thrown away. Another neat thing about collecting coin boards, the big 11 by 14s that I've been promoting and collecting for many years, as well as the folders is in the early years, they typically came with a, a dealer's vendor stamp or sticker. This is uh, the dealer from whom he bought the folder would usually stamp it with his business name so that you knew where to get additional folders if desired. And also if you were to show your collection to another kid in the neighborhood, he would know where to get this. And it was really good for business to include this information. So it's a nice little assortment here. Uh, we have a major dealer there, Abner Kreisberg, Coin Gallery had been in partnership with Abe Kossoff for a number of years before going on his own. So it shows that even the big boys were selling Whitman folders. Uh, one of the best names in numismatic history, uh, not so much for numismatics in the scientific sense, but in the marketing sense, was Ben Stamp and Coin Company in Chicago. Ben Driesky was a huge advocate early on of Whitman's coin boards and folders at a time when most major dealers dismissed them as, as, as something for kids. So here's his stamp uh, at the old address on Washington Street uh, the business has gone through many changes of ownership of the years and is now on North Clark Street as uh, Harlan J. Burt, as the descendant of this old Chicago coin shop. Colonial Coin and Stamp Company in Cleveland. Uh, that name is familiar to coin board collectors as there was a Colonial Coin and Stamp brand of coin boards. However, this is a different company, or let's say it went through a change of ownership. We don't have the documentation to know it, but this is not the New York company that produced the coin boards in the 30s. Uh, some others, Morton Stamp in St. Louis, Earl A. Parker in San Francisco, which is my hometown. Uh, Parker died in 1964, so I never met him, but I, I have a lot of friends, some now deceased, who did know him, so I've heard a lot of great stories about Earl Parker. A hobby shop in Miami, Florida actually had a clear plastic sticker affixed to its coin folders. I'm not certain of the vintage of this. This could be later than the folder that it's on because sometimes dealers buy out old coin shops and then put their own stamp on an old folder. F.W. Woolworth uh, is a company that looms large in people of my generation. It's been out of business in the United States for over 20 years. 
although I think it still survives in the UK, where they call it Woolies, out of affectionate familiarity. You can see that by the price sticker, 25 cents, this is from an early folder. The retail price was raised to 35 cents in 1953. Another variety store similar to Woolworths was W.T. Grant, and I did buy some coin folders there, although not this particular one. You can see it was originally priced at 39 cents, which dates it to the period 1967 to 70. That was the list price then. It was marked down to 20 cents, didn't sell, finally marked down to 10 cents. And I guess at that point it finally sold. Uh, I don't know where I got this or when, but it's great to see that familiar forgotten name, W.T. Grant. Uh, when I was a kid, Coin folders and coin products were everywhere, and there were a lot of different variety stores. Some of the chains we shopped at were Kresge and Kress, two different brands that sound alike. Um, ben Franklin stores were very big uh, in the San Francisco area. I don't think they were a national chain. Uh, JJ Newberry's was another one that was national. And if you were around collecting coins in those days, you remember those familiar retailers, all now wiped out by the Kmarts and Walmarts of the world but they live on in vendor stamps. I promised to show you some original paper wrap bundles. Here we have some nice examples here. The one on the upper left is an older one. This is from the early 1960s and it has that Whitman Oval logo. It was first used in 1961. Uh, the others are from a little later generation. You see the Whitman Eagle logo on the one in the middle. So that dates this to about 1965, 66. And then much later, you have the Whitman Globe logo with the smaller format. So this one here dates probably from the late 60s, 1970s. That was the last generation of Whitman folders to be paper wrapped. Notice they come in either one dozen or a half dozen sizes. And I have probably, I don't know, 25 or 30 of these bundles. If I bought every one that I found for the eighth edition, I would have a couple hundred by now. But uh, they're, they're on eBay all the time, and I only buy them if they're priced right because they are fairly common. Another tie-in items that I get from my collection, these are old display racks. Uh, the one on the left, I think, dates from the 1980s. It's a cardboard assembly. And the interesting thing is a lot of these were actually the shipping boxes. Uh, if you cut the shipping box just right, it could be folded into a display, and that's what dealers and coin shops and other venues were told to do with these boxes. There's just a nice little collection of assorted titles, uh, just a random offering. The interesting one you see there in the lower right of the left photo, that's the full-size coin assessing chart that came out in 1966. And that's the one that you see a little more often than the junior one. On the right is a typical wire display rack uh, right at the beginning of the program, we saw that Whitman coin display in color of all of its different products on, on sale. They, uh, they use these wire racks. They're, they come in assorted sizes. Some of them are quite elaborate, uh, vertical units and whatever. But I picked this up somewhere at a coin shop. Uh, the owner just had no use for them anymore. So could have had as many as I wanted, but since I'm not going into business for myself, I only grabbed one. It's a nice way to show uh, these old folders in a vintage manner. And this is my collection of Whitman folders by titles, editions, varieties, vendor stamps, errors, everything imaginable. Basically everything I've ever found in Whitman folders, you can see takes quite a bit of space. Um, I don't advocate that other people collect as comprehensively as I'm doing. I mean, you're not going to write a book, so you don't need to have one of everything. But there are just any number of ways to collect Whitman folders. Just collecting one of each title that's ever been produced is a pretty impressive collection in its own right. Um, you can see uh, in the photos on the left, there's several of these paper wrap bundles. I have them not just for the Whitman folders, but down at the bottom there, you'll see some for the Whitman all-in-one line, which are those oversized green folders you see on the second shelf from the bottom. Uh, there's also uh, a plastic wrap bundle of those, but that wasn't produced by Whitman. That was some seller who was stuck with these things that had gone out of print and decided to market them as a three for one set. I think it was a dollar for all three. And for some reason that survived to the present day. The dealer I bought them from was going to tear, tear them open and sell me the three folders uh, without the wrapping. And I said, no, I'm buying it for the wrapping. And uh, 
That's just one of many times when I've left people dazed and confused. Uh, on the right is a close up of something that's, uh, that's so, sort of hidden in the overall view. And you can see all the different sizes and styles and graphics of these Whitman packs. Most of these are eighth edition because that's what survives. But you can see there's some interesting titles there like Large Sense. Uh, you know, the more common ones Franklin has listed as either Ben Franklin or in later printings, Franklin. Notice the codes also, uh, the little block letters there that are at the bottom of each of these packs. I have never broken that code, but it was certainly something that was for Whitman's distribution department um, or so just to make things easier to package and distribute. Uh, in my book, I describe some of the codes that I have broken, broken so that you can understand what they mean on the actual folders. But the, the codes on these paper wraps, I, I have no idea what they mean and probably never will. Anybody who was involved in that end of the product is uh, not with us anymore. And I love Whitman folders so much that when it came time to write the book, I made the cover of the book a Whitman folder, or rather my book designer artist did. And she did a wonderful job with this. I gave her a, a really high resolution image of a Whitman coin folder from the sixth edition. Again, that's my favorite edition with that Eagle logo, 1965 to six. And I gave her the text to replace the original. She did it in the exact same fonts as you see on the Whitman folders. So if you were to see this at a glance, you would think it was simply a Whitman folder. And the last image here just shows some of the content of the book. I, I'm not gonna do an infomercial on, on, on my book, but you can see that the detail into which I go where I itemize each of the different variations of these folders. All I can say is it's been a wild ride. I've been collecting coins for 56 years now and Whitman has been a part of that all along. It's only been in the last 40 years that I thought of the folders and boards and books and such as being collectibles in their own right. But uh, I'm just having a blast with it. It's an inexpensive hobby, uh, with the exception of the first edition folders are going up in value. It's something that anybody can jump into at any level, and I'm just having a great time with it. And that's all I have for a formal presentation. Certainly, if there are any questions, I would be more than welcome to answer them. Everybody, I apologize for all of the technical issues we had at the beginning. I don't know what happened, but we made it through and we do have some questions to ask. So David, if you want to stop your screen share so that everyone can see your picture bigger on the screen. Okay, uh, you mean shut off the video presentation? Yes, so that'd be okay. at the top of the screen, you should see a red stop share button. Okay, you can, you can imagine I'm a little technically challenged. I'm on the, right on the edge between being too old to understand computers and uh, not, not uh, just not just not caring about them anymore. <laughs> but I learn them when I have to. Yeah, and technology doesn't work how it's supposed to, anyways, all the time, as we've figured out today from the beginning of this presentation. So in indeed, indeed, there were a couple of mistakes. Awesome. Well, we do have a few questions. Um, someone asks, do other countries have these types of folders for their coins? Uh, there are coin folders made in other countries, and I do collect those. Um, the biggest deterrent to that is the shipping cost. I, I love the Australian folders put out by Bertrand, John Bertrand, and a couple of other countries, but I can buy them for 8 or $10, and then it's $35 to ship it to America. So that is a bit of a deterrent. Uh, there are extensive lines of folders for uh, UK coins, most of which date from the period uh, just prior to decimalization, 1968 to 70 or so, uh, when the old coins were about to disappear. There were several lines of folders that came out. Um, I have some others. I have some from Japan, uh, some from Philippines. But by and large, it's, it's mostly the Western nations that have these. Uh, one of the general comment I'll have is that most coin albums produced in other countries, for whether for their country's coinage or other nations' coinage, uh, they tend to lean heavily on vinyl plastics, which we learned some years ago are not good for coins. So uh, you don't often see cardboard albums, which are a little chemically safer, although they can tone coins, 
Uh, so I, I do kind of advise people to avoid things that are all plastic because they're usually a little toxic. But as far as collectability, yes, uh, there are vintage pieces out there and the biggest obstacle is finding them being sold in the United States where the shipping cost isn't prohibitive. Cool. Um, someone asks, what metal or alloy was used in, for the printing plates? Uh, that's a good question. They're darned heavy. So I'm inclined to say that they're, 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 they could be steel. Although I think, and again, I'm not in the printing business. I think they're probably some sort of zinc or zinc alloy. Uh, they're not really tough. The ones that were actually used for printing, like that, that Jefferson nickel folder there, uh, the printing plate, uh, they actually have a lot of dents and dings in them. So whatever it was, it was not tough. If they got dropped, it would get dented. But I, I, I suspect it's some sort of zinc alloy or lead alloy, um, you know, but uh, again, it's kind of out of my area of expertise. I'd have to take them down to NGC and <laughs> do an x-ray analysis to find out what they are. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question, did Whitman ever warn collectors not to fill their folders with uncirculated coins if they wanted to maintain the value and luster? They also mentioned that Woolworths has gone out of business in the UK. Oh, sorry to hear that. Well, now I have no reason to go to England. Well, I guess I could go there and look for coins, but... Um, yeah. No, I don't think, uh, I, I don't imagine Whitman ever deterred people from using its product. I mean, it's it's generally understood by anybody with experience in the hobby that, you know, Whitman folders are used for beginning collections, circulated coins and whatever. Uh, I, I don't put high grade coins in them. I, I do still have some circulated collections and folders and, and cardboard albums, but uh, it's, I think it's generally understood that this is a stepping stone to a more advanced hobby. Cool. Um, someone has a question. I guess it's more of a comment. Maybe you can um, give your insight on the comment. Um, they said, very impressive collection. I was wondering if TG and Y sold Whitman. TG and Y. I yes. didn't have to tell me what that is. I'm not familiar with TG and Y either. I don't know if it's a coin related business or a coin store. Um, so whoever put that in the um, q and I wanna keep it anonymous. So if you have any insight on that question, um, put another comment in there and I can see if I can clarify it later. Um, another question, where and what is the best source of locating earlier editions? Um, as in so many things, I think eBay is probably the best place to look. Um, before eBay, I used to have to literally drive from coin shop to coin shop in whatever part of the country I was living, initially California and then later New Jersey and, and more recently Florida for about 20 years now. And it was, it was just a matter of making all the rounds of the shops. Fortunately, I, I justified that by the fact I was looking for coins as well, but I'd always get some puzzled looks when I asked for coin folders. Um, and, and back before eBay also, for the internet in general, dealers would sometimes take stacks or box full of coin folders to the shows. You don't see that much anymore because if they have these things, they do tend to sell them online. Um, if you do have an opportunity, if there's a coin shop within a reasonable driving distance, don't be afraid to go in there and ask them if they have old coin folders and albums. They're usually not on display. Only have, they have only the new clean stuff on display. The old stuff's in the back room, along with bags full of wheat pennies and, you know, whatever sort of junk that dealers never seem to get around to. Yeah. Um, so clarification on the previous comment. They said it's similar to Woolworths. And someone else said it's a huge five and dime store throughout the Midwest. Oh, well, that explains. I've never lived in the Midwest. I actually did not see the name. Um, I'll certainly look for any old vendor stickers. I don't know how many years that company's been in business, but that would be a great one to find. Yeah. You know, and, and to get back to the other question, I, I, I'm a little reluctant to point this out, but I do actually deal in coin boards and folders uh, with the Whitmans, primarily the first editions. There's not a lot of value after that. So if somebody's really serious about this, they, they can find me easily enough. I'm not going to okay. uh, bore you with my email and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, does your book have values for each or some of the editions? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, as yet, it's, it's a little hard to determine values on a hobby that hasn't really taken off. I'd say in a general sense, anything that's first edition 
you're not going to touch it for less than about $25. Rare titles are creeping up to where they're almost three figures now. It's like every time I put out a list with them, they sell out instantly. You know, the first person who sees the list buys them all. So I'm gradually raising the prices. If nothing else, then to, you know, maybe induce some people to sell or, or you know, it's, it, it's an evolving thing. And the reality is, unless it's a rare title that somebody wants just for the title, you know, like the, the Irish coins or whatever, pretty much from the third or fourth editions, basically 1950s onward, Whitman folders are not bringing much of anything. A used folder in clean conditions, like a $1 item. You go to a coin show, sometimes the club's giving them away for free. You know, so all the value is in the first editions or in really rare items like the Irish folders. Okay. Um, someone asks, where can we purchase your book and will you autograph it, autograph it if we were to bring you one to a show, to a coin show? Uh, well, I'll say right away, yes, to the second question. I, I do a lot of shows with NGC. I usually be found at their booth and I'll always happily sign it for you as long as we're not too busy at that particular moment. Come see me in the afternoon when things settle down. Uh, as far as buying the book, it's on my website. Uh, forgive me, I'll, I'll give a brief plug, coincollectingboards.com. Uh, I know Wizard sells it also. Uh, it's on eBay and Amazon. So usual venues. I mean, if you look for it, it's there. It's not hard to find. Okay. Um, besides the Three Cent album, what are the rarer editions? Uh, well, it's strictly in the, in the first edition, we're talking about titles. Uh, I only recently added the one for half dimes and I, I paid a lot of money for it because the seller was somebody who had my book and was is been getting my newsletters and whatever. So he knew he had something gold in there and we negotiated a price, but uh, that was an expensive item. Um, the rarities are mostly the ones that I showed in this video, the Irish folders, uh, the custom printings for, for Franklin Mint and such. Um, you know, oddities like that. And of course, the Lincoln National Life, I've never actually seen in the flesh. I've only seen it on the internet. Yeah. And that was an old image of that. It was a very poor one. It took me an hour in Photoshop to, to make hmm. those images usable. Wow. Um, a question. I have a couple of the initial Red Book mini folders, slots for 1946 and 1996 dime, but they were empty or unused. Do you know if they came with dimes? And if so, were they a promotion for employees or anything like that? Well, at the 1996 a and convention, when they were first given out, they had, uh, Whitman had a limited number of folders with the dimes in place. I think I got two of those, which, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't willing to part with any more than that. He's, even when silver was at five or $6 an ounce, there was some value in that silver dime. Uh, and then you could get as many as you wanted of the ones without dimes. However, however many uh, came with dimes, I don't know. I would say they ran out on the half, first half of the first day. So there were probably no more than a hundred or so. Wow. Um, without the dimes, they're much more common. Yeah. Uh, another question, is it possible to date Whitman bookshelf? Is it possible to date Whitman bookshelf albums by their design to specific years and months? Or do you put them in, into a certain chronological order of printing? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, my book covers Whitman's bookshelf albums, basically all Whitman folders and albums up through 1978. Uh, there are two major editions of the bookshelf album. You know, they're easy to spot by the logo. The first edition of 1961 to, uh, oh, I'd say about 1972, has the Eagle logo, my favorite, the Eagle Whitman. And then uh, starting uh, midway through 1972 or late, late 72, they switched to the Whitman Globe logo that skeletal globe. So that's the basic breakdown. But there are also different publication varieties. Uh, some of the bigger printings in the 1960s had four different variations of the publication. And I've dated all of these. So uh, there, each publication type is numbered and it gives a date span. And then in the catalog portion, I describe all of the features. It's publication three, it's uh, logo number two, that sort of thing. So you can figure out from the book, certainly all of the, uh, when, it, when all of these things were printed. But if you just know the basics, the break from the old logo to the new logo was 1973. And they were, they stopped printing them in 78, which is the cutoff date of my book. They switched to Whitman's current classic album. Okay. 
Got it. Um, it looks like we have one more question in the queue. Um, if anyone has any, put them in there as soon as possible so we can make sure to answer them. Uh, the last one in queue currently, do you have a current pricing list for your inventory, which you could publish or email or get on your newsletter? Um, yeah, if you if you write to me uh, through my website, coincollectingboards.com, I'll be happy to send you a newsletter and price list. I, I put out the newsletter certainly uh, quarterly. It's coin board news because it began with the big 11 by 14 boards, but it's gradually morphing to cover uh, folders and albums, at least for the early years. And uh, I usually try to put out a price list unless I haven't been able to get anything new significantly. And I'll also take want lists if people know exactly what they're looking for. Okay. Uh, one more question did pop in the chat. Um, when did the additions begin with the plastic sleeves? Plastic sleeves. I think the plastic albums think, that you were talking about, when did that start? I think, oh, I'm not sure. I mean, it could be talking about the slides that cover the coins on both sides. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that, the first product Whitman had with that was the bookshelf album, which debuted early in 61. Okay. Uh, the folders, of course, have always been and remain push-in items. Yeah. Because of only on one side. Okay. Um, we do have another question. Do you think that there's a future for the folder with the next generation? If you had asked me this question maybe 25 years ago, I'd say, no, it's, it's, it's doomed. But then, uh, you know, when with the introduction of the uh, state quarter program, coin folders exploded. Coin folders and albums, both. Whitman produced a lot. Uh, publishers who hadn't done it for years jumped back in. And they're still selling. I mean, if they, if they weren't selling, they, people would not be producing them. But you're still getting new folders created for uh, the innovation dollars, you know, the America, the beautiful quarters. Uh, so obviously, there's still a market for it. It's, it's never going to be as big as it was in the early to mid 60s. That was the high water mark for coin collecting is a popular everyman kind of hobby where the people were literally just filling the holes. It was the last time you could get silver coins. Uh, it was the last time that wheat cents were common and you could still find buffalo nickels. And, you know, I remember all that great stuff. I, the last two or three years of their circulation, I was already in the hobby. But uh, even though the, the market for folders may not be as big in the future, I think it's still going to be around. What you're not going to see is folders for early coin types. Uh, they're not bringing back liberty seated half dollar folders and large set folders. That's Those, those, those are gone forever. Most of those Whitman stopped printing in the early to mid 60s because the market just wasn't there anymore. Okay. And it looks like one more question popped in. Uh, this will probably be our last question for this session. Um, what else do you collect? Do you collect any other things? Uh, well, I, I collect coins, of course. Um, you know, I can't get away from that. Uh, my focus in recent years has been adding to my US typeset because I teach a class on that uh, for the ANA summer seminar, which I just recently learned is probably back on for 2022. So I will be doing that, God willing. Um, I collect, I, I don't know if I collect books so much, numismatic literature, I buy what I think is usable, but that's a very broad topic. So I guess you could call my library a collection. Uh, and as far as other collectibles, eh, not, not really so much. I mean, really everything is numismatically related. Um, there's a million things in the hobby that I collect, scanomatic coin viewers from the 60s. And I, I love little plastic gadgets that enable the hobby. There's this thing called a uh, roto grade where you, it looks like an old fill canister and you turn these wheels and the picture of the grade comes up and uh, all sorts of little gimmicky things that were so popular in the 50s and 60s, back when the hobby was really simple. There were only like five grades. There were no, num no numeric grades. and there are all sorts of gadgets. Also, all of the literature that goes with it, dealer catalogs. Uh, I, I mentioned Robert Friedberg, who had this chain of department stores and variety stores that had their own coin and stamp departments and actually sold coins and stamps as well as the supplies. Uh, there were 38 of those stores around the country at the peak of the market in the mid 60s. And I'm trying to get the catalog that he put out for all 38. I have probably about oh, maybe about 24, 25 different stores. There was a thing called Coin and Stamp News, which was basically his catalog that was distributed free to everybody who went to these department stores. Um, 
I, I must have had one at some time because I used to buy coins at San Francisco's Emporium, uh, which is surprisingly close to the old Mint Museum there. It was a double treat to go down there. But I'm trying to get all 38, and I don't know if they exist. So that, that's I collect stuff relating to the hobby's history, particularly in the period of coin boards and folders, 1930s onward. Okay. And we do have one more question. I think it should be a quick one. Um, do you have an estimate value of the Scanomatic coin viewer? <laughs> yeah, um, the first time I saw one for sale on eBay, I think it brought something like $45, but that brought them out of the woodwork. So uh, there was a, quite a flurry of them. I, I have so many now that I've stopped looking because I have them every different color and packaging. I think I have about 11 or 12 because uh, the, the product actually got sold from one company to another over a period of about 15 years. Uh, I would say now a clean example that's fully functional, probably worth about twenty to twenty-five dollars, just because there there are enough of them out there now. It's a handy little gadget. I won't try to explain it now, but uh, yeah, you know, look on eBay and you'll find them. That can be a presentation for the next NNP symposium. Exactly, we can go through <laughs> an entire roll of coins using Scanomatic. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, that is all that we have time for today. Um, thank you to all of our um, attendants, our participants that tuned in to hear David Lang talk. Um, sorry for all the technical difficulties again. Um, we hope that you turn in, tune in to different presentations um, with the NNP Symposium. We go, uh, we have more presentations today and more on Sunday. So we hope you tune in. And thank you again, David, for volunteering your time and your knowledge on this awesome topic. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a great one.